As regular viewers of this show will know, the world is a very strange and magnificent place. My name's John Downs. I'm the director of the Centre for Fortune Zoology, and welcome to another episode of On the Track. This episode of On the Track is dedicated to the memory of Sid Henley, co-proprietor of Afro Books and an old friend of the CFZ, who died on September the 3rd. If you remember last time, I promised to tell you what happened to Richard and his team in Moscow. At the airport in Moscow, we were stopped because our visas had run out the day before. Now, we were travelling between two airports, Minerali Bodhi and Moscow. The company we got the visas from said it wouldn't matter because we were being in transit. So the fact that the, uh, the visa ran out on a day we were travelling back shouldn't matter because we were on our way back already. The Russians begged to differ and uh, we were stopped and taken away uh, by armed guards into a small room for about three hours whilst they sorted out interpreters and policemen. We were then told we would have to get new visas, pay a fine, and pay for new tickets back to these roads. First of all, we had to find and speak with the Russian consulate, which wasn't easy. We had to go to a information point, and we were told then, after some uh, dithering, that, they, that the consulate wouldn't be open for another hour. So we had to wait around and then try and find the consulate again. It turns out that the consulate wasn't a building somewhere, it was a little phone attached to an office somewhere in Moscow airport. So finally we got to talk to somebody at the Russian consulate who said, oh no, you don't have to contact me, you have to contact the British consulate first and then they contact me. And that's the way we did it. So then we had to go back to several different points, uh, uh, information points, to try and get hold of the British consulate. We finally got hold of the British consulate. Then the British consulate had to get hold of the Russian consulate. Then the Russian consulate said we'd got to prove we'd paid our fine and brought the tickets back before he could give us the new uh, visa. So we were going round and round and round in circles and it took us the better part of 24 hours to sort this whole goddamn thing out. And finally, we got on a plane at uh, 7.30 in the evening uh, a 500 pounds lighter. And what exactly is an Almasti? The Almasti is a hairy wild man reported from the mountains of Russia and the former Soviet Union. Uh, it's bigger than a, a modern man, seven, seven and a half feet tall, but considerably smaller and more human looking than the classic Yeti or Sasquatch. Uh, it has a thick brow ridge, a flat nose, uh, powerful jaws. Uh, it's generally dark in colour, either a, a grey or black or auburn colour. Uh, very primitive. Uh, it will use uh, rocks uh, and clubs as weapons, but it has no fire. There's some evidence that it will make uh, stone axes, primitive stone axes. It has a diet very similar to a brown bear. Uh, despite its massive strength, it's not thought to be aggressive to people in Russia just accept it as another part of the fauna, a, a wild man, no more fantastical than a bear or a wolf, if a little rarer. In a uh, garden of uh, his uh, grandmother, a uh, woman, how must it? she make uh, something separate in this uh, that, uh, tree, as he said, something like uh, not house but nest. And uh, we are living there. If uh, anybody comes uh, uh, in night uh, in this uh, garden, uh, our musty uh, uh, didn't attack him, but uh, shows herself and uh, he ran away. Uh, with the uh, grandmother, uh, she was in uh, good attention. Uh, um, she often was sitting and um, Combing. Huh? 
длинные полностью. Для uh, he, he shows. Салон. Long head Вот такие. А? Ноги вот такие. А, еще feet were very warm, very much. I've had all sorts of accusations levied against me over the years. People say that I'm intransigent, that I'm not prepared to listen to new theories. Well, guys, if you're trying to persuade me that there's a new species of unknown giant hyrax living on Dartmoor, I'm not. And that I run the CFZ like some sort of despot, hiding in what the Americans call a spider hole, waiting for Armageddon, and in the meantime, whiling away my time by being a debunker. Well, I don't think that's fair. I don't think that's me at all. So to illustrate this, welcome to Tales from Debunker! This is the Daily Mirror on the 25th of May. Is this a giant terrifying river monster? Creepy footage of beast from the deep that could be the Loch Ness Monster's cousin? Well, I don't think so. I mean, if you look at it here, it's not actually proof of anything. It's proof of some vague grey blur in a very, very badly pixelated video, which could be anything anywhere. The soundtrack over the top has got somebody talking in Chinese over the top of it, but my Cantonese is terrible and I really can't tell you what they're saying or why they're saying it. It could be anything. It's certainly not definitive proof of a monster. What is it with the British red-topped tabloid newspapers and the Loch Ness Monster? And why can't anybody working for them use the English language? Is that the Loch Ness? No, it's obviously not the Loch Ness because it's in bloody Florida. Viewers terrified by hellish footage of underwater monster. Well, it would be exciting if there was a hellish footage of underwater monster. There's nothing of the sort. Look what we got here. The person starting off is not terrified, he's got a stupid look on his face and he's throwing a bucket of probably fish guts into the water where some freshwater fish, by the looks of it, who are all fairly habituated to being fed by the guy, come up to the surface. It's not underwater footage of a Loch Ness monster. This is the latest. Is this the Loch Ness Monster in Houston? No, it's quite a clever bit of photoshopping which has cashed in on an appalling natural disaster in order to do quite a groovy piece of imagery. But it's a fake, it's a joke, and don't take it seriously, guys, please. Well, I've got no shame. I'll appear on most television programmes if they pay me. And I paid on this one. Why? Because they paid me. But even I wasn't prepared for the absolute farrago of nonsense that came out of it. First of all, just look at this. Yeah, it's very blurry, but it's obviously a wild boar. Now, the film was taken soon after animal rights protesters let a load of wild boar out from a rare breeds farm and a lot of the female wild boar, the wild sows, were pregnant. And lo, hope, hey presto, we've got um, wild boar living in the West Country again for the first time since the reign of Charles II. I did a TV show called Fact or Faked in which we had to examine this, and I said pretty well exactly what I just said to you. I gave the dates of when the wild boar were released by the animal rights protesters, and I gave the dates of when they were hunted to extinction in the reign of Charles II. And what was the result that the TV company came up with? This was an undoubted cross between a wild lion and a wild boar. I can't be bothered to tell you quite what a stupid hypothesis this is because I know somebody who's going to be able to explain it far better than I. And so, my little truffle hunters, it's over to Dr. Max Blake. <laughs> Well, 
what are the chances of a lion, a lion or a lioness being able to interbreed with a male or a female wild boar? So far beyond calculation, it's impossible. It's, it's not something that could ever happen. Well, apart from the fact that um, the lion would probably eat the wild boar, can you explain why wouldn't it work? So there are a number of uh, different things that have to happen uh, for a gamete to form and then for that gamete to develop into an embryo and then sort of into, into an actual animal. So every single one of those different stages presents something, a barrier, that has to be overcome for two species to actually uh, hybridize. So the closer the two different organisms are to each other, then uh, the, the less these, these barriers actually sort of uh, cause problems. So, for instance, um, two of the classic stages are what are called post-zygotic uh, barriers and pre-zygotic barriers. So pre-zygotic barriers are anything that stops uh, they're actually being um, a mating chance. So this would be, for instance, if hypothetically wild boars only bred in spring and lions only bred in autumn. At the time that lions were re able to reproduce, uh, wild boar wouldn't be. And this is something that we see an awful lot in all sorts of different animals, um, from, from insects to mammals. As well as that, there's behavioural differences, so um, issues with uh, say, one species seeing a different species as an actual mate, even recognizing it as the same species, they may not recognize it as the compatible sex. Um, but beyond all this, uh, even if they could actually mate, you then have what are called post-zygotic uh, barriers. So these are things like um, essentially defenses that the egg have uh, or has against um, certain types of sperm actually fertilizing it, um, other sort of chemical or molecular um, issues uh, within reproductive structures that cause these things to fail. Um, and then even if they do actually manage to fertilize, once the cell divides, there can often be major issues in chromosome compatibility. So when the cell divides, the two different, the two pairs of each of the chromosomes inherited from the mother and the father um, segregate themselves along a central barrier and then split. But if there aren't enough of them uh, together so that there's the usual compatible pair, then quite often cell division doesn't start, or if the two chromosomes from the two different species are totally different sizes, it also won't start. So even if that all happens and it gets through to being a fertilized um, egg, it won't actually produce a blastula and then an embryo and then so on and so forth. He's such a nice boy. Last month we brought a report from our friend Colin Schneider, but we forgot to introduce him, and that's what we're going to do now. Hello, my name is Colin Schneider. Um, I'm 15, I'm a member from Ohio in the United States. I'll be on this YouTube channel periodically to kind of give an update on what I'm doing, what I'm researching. I have a ton of knowledge, ton of interest, and being a member of the Center for Fortean Zoology is awesome because I get so many cool opportunities to meet all these cool people that I've grown up watching on television, and it's just very cool, and I'm very, very proud to be a part of this YouTube channel. There are legends all over the world about a man beast platting the manes of domestic horses. Richard and his team came across such a case in Russia about a month ago. Oh, yeah, it's weak, yeah. Oh, right. 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 Surely this could be occur naturally, couldn't it? Of course it could, there's another horse with a plotted mane that uh, some people think is the work of the Almasty. I think it's got nothing to do with it whatsoever. I think it just occurs naturally as the animal moves around at night. But many people think it's the work of the Almasty. 
they used to think it was fairies doing no, it in no, uh, we are not absolutely sure. in uh, Europe. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm totally unconvinced. They used to call it being hag ridden in oh. Europe. Probably is, yeah. We'll be returning to Richard's and the gang in Russia next month, but in the meantime, here's something closer to home. Professor Bernard Heuvelman was the man most generally agreed to have been the person who started the science of cryptozoology, said that there are lost worlds everywhere. Well, one of the saddest things about the 21st century is that we as a species are becoming more and more divorced from the reality of the natural world, and there are all sorts of strange creatures living within a stone's throw of our houses, which are completely and utterly alien to us. Charlotte has set herself the task of finding some of them. So a week or so ago, my 2G4 Tough Olympus arrived in the post, so I decided to film I headed down to the nearest beach, Hartland Key, and did some underwater filming. I was simply diving and swimming under the water to try and get the feel of filming and swimming at the same time. A couple of days or so later, I headed down again, this time on the search for sea hares. I had seen one with my mother a little while back and was hoping to see one again. To my delight, when I got to the rock pool, I saw not one, but three sea hares and another one in a different rock pool. Now a little bit about them. They are marine mollusks which are related to sea slugs. Their name comes from the two antennae-like sensory receptors on their heads, which scientists thought like, looked like hares. The Latin name for this species is Lycia punctata. As far as I know, this species doesn't have a common name, so I'll just be referring it to it as sea hare. This sea hare is the most common species in Britain. Sometimes tens of thousands come up on shore and nobody knows why. The genus Alpsia, which this species belongs to, produces and secretes a toxic substance much like ammonia in self-defense. It was originally thought to be ink like an octopus. But all sorts of other unlucky creatures turn up on the shores of Heartland on a regular basis. Recently, according to local news websites, goose barnacles of a species similar to these ones from Japan washed up in one of the small beaches along the Heartland coastline. Charlotte and her mum and dad went looking for them but couldn't find any, which is a pity because goose barnacles were a very Fortean creature. Back in the day, people believed that they actually turned into barnacle geese. In a very peculiar piece of magical metamorphosis. Why they believed this, I've never been quite sure. So if anybody knows, please drop us a line. Earlier this year, however, something which was completely impossible to ignore washed up on the beach at Heartland. I don't know about you, but to me at least, the fact that a creature as awesome as this, even if it is dead and rather worse for wear, can exist only a few miles away from where we all live, is an absolutely fantastic thing, and one of the great realisations of our place here on the planet. Oh well, I know exactly what's going to happen next. It's going to be a rerun of what happened a few years ago when I started attacking the badger cull. Somebody's going to get their ass in their hand and complain that I'm being disloyal to the farming community. I'm not being disloyal to anybody, but God, I hate animal cruelty. And you can't get much worse of institutionalised animal cruelty than battery chickens. Keeping any creature in conditions like this is just despicable by anybody's standards. So, a few weeks ago, when we heard that there were some battery chickens looking to be rehomed by a charity which saves them from slaughter, we decided to step up and do our bit. <coughs> Ha 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 ha!
engineers would say, offering up the um, egg box or nesting box to the rest of the structure. Well, I wish I could tell you that all six of them lived happily ever after, but unfortunately one died of shock within only a few minutes of being put into the coop. But the rest of them are doing well, laying eggs and living a happy chicken-orientated lifestyle underneath the blue sky for the first time in their lives. Not only have we got a seasonally unlimited source of fresh eggs, which taste much nicer than anything that you buy in a supermarket, <laughs> But I think we've done something good. But now it's time to go over to my lovely wife Karina and our regular monthly visit to the Watcher of the Skies. I've always felt a curious affinity with this species of bird, probably because for 30 years I was a secretary and this is a secretary bird. A highly specialised ground dwelling bird of prey from an older family than the other old world raptors. It is native to sub-Saharan Africa and is sadly non-migratory so will never be a natural visitor to these shores. But I think you'd be surprised quite how many completely unexpected avian visitors Britain does have. And that's what this segment on the track is all about. Bernard Hoivermans himself said that cryptozoology wasn't the study of monsters, but the study of unexpected animals. And in the UK, what could be more unexpected than vultures, spoonbills and albatrosses? Yes, even the kings of the Southern Ocean have been seen in British waters. Two species of albatross have been recorded in the UK in recent years. Not all of our feathered visitors are quite so spectacular, but nearly every day there is something exciting to greet the watcher of the skies. Hello, my little tom tits. After years of conservation efforts to create the ideal habitat, it has been a record year for breeding black-winged stilts over here in Blighty. 13 chicks have successfully fledged from sites in Kent, Cambridgeshire and Norfolk. The bird has become a more frequent sight over here in recent years after moving from its traditional nesting grounds in southern Europe, but fledgling, fledglings are still very rare. Over the last decade there have only been a handful of successful breeding attempts. In their more natural Mediterranean setting, stilts prefer nesting in shallow lagoons and salt pans. But over here it is fairly usual for them to visit a number of potential nesting sites before settling. It is hoped that this year marks a change in fortunes for the species in the UK. Another bird having successful breeding here, this time for the first time, is the black crowned night heron. Two recently fledged young birds are now at Somerset Wildlife Trust's West Hay Moor NNR on the Somerset levels. This bird is a scarce visitor for Britain, with an average of around 10 or so records a year. Only a dozen have been reported in Somerset since 1800. And as a couple of points of interest which I found out whilst looking up this bird's details, there are apparently two archaeological specimens of the black rat night heron in Great Britain. The oldest is from the Roman London Wall, 
and the more recent one is from the Royal Navy's at H Medieval Victualling Yards in Greenwich. Apparently Victualling should be pronounced Victualling. It appears in the London Poulterer's price lists as the Brew, a bird which was thought to have been the Wimbrel or Grossy Ibis, which has now been shown to refer to the black crowned night heron, derived from the medieval French, and forgive my French, Bioru, or Bioro. Bioro, I think. In modern times, the black crowned night heron is a vagrant, and feral breeding colonies were established at Edinburgh Zoo from 1950 to the 21st century and at Great Witchingham in Norfolk where there were pairs in 2003. There have recently been four new species added to the BOU's British list, these being the pale-legged leaf warbler, the eastern kingbird, the western swamp hen and the red-footed booby. The pale... Stop laughing Jonathan. The pale-legged leaf warbler is a spe spe species. Oh no, we start that again. The pale <laughs> now you've got me laughing because you started laughing. The pale-legged leaf. <laughs> the pale-legged leaf warbler is a species of old world. <laughs> The pale-legged leaf warbler is a species of old world warbler which is normally found in Manchuria and winters in Southeast Asia. The eastern kingbird is widespread in North America, migrating to South America. The western swamp hen is normally found on the Iberian Peninsula, from France, Sardinia and western North Africa to Tunisia. While the red-footed booby breeds on islands throughout the tropics. While ber with birds dispersing to oceanic waters after breeding, the species known for wandering far. This last bird was found at St Leonard's on Sea in East Sussex last sem September, when it was taken into care until the 16th of December before being transported back to the Cayman Islands, which are in its natural range. But unfortunately, it then died in quarantine before it could be released. Now I'm sure that Mr. Director, producer, Dolly Grip, best boy and all-round good egg, Jonathan, will attempt to put a picture of the Western Swamp Hen on the video. What a magnificently peculiar looking species it is, with one of those beaks that seems to indicate that if it could talk, it would speak as if pestered by over-exuberant adenoids and chunter away about slimy things under its feet while continuously complaining about anything and everything. An American yellow warbler was a rare find in County Cork towards the end of the last month of August. The species breeds in almost the whole of North America down to North and South, South America. So if you ever grow across the sea to Ireland and you're a rare feathered friend, you will definitely get a warm welcome from people with binoculars, that's for sure. One of the UK's rarest birds of prey returned to Hampshire for the first time in 45 years during the latter part of August. A pair of marsh harriers bred at Titchfield Haven Nature Reserve and raised two chicks. Although the parents have now left, the young are still there and likely to remain for a few more weeks yet, before heading off to Europe or North Africa for the winter, hopefully to return again early next spring. This species was once widespread, but habitat loss and persecution wiped them out by the end of the 19th century. However, numbers have been slowly climbing since the 70s, with most pairs found in eastern England. And now over to the resident Good Egg Jonathan's roundup of this episode's new and rediscovered species. Some years ago, scientists in India discovered a peculiar new species of bright purple frog that lived mostly underground. It was so strange that people assumed it was a one-off and there would be no relatives, but now a relative has been found. The frog is called Bhupati's purple frog in honour of Dr. Subraniyam Bhupati, a well-known Indian herpetologist who lost his life surveying the Western Ghats in 2014. Its appearance is characterised by a shiny purple coat, light blue rings around tiny eyes and a signature pig snout nose. 
With its long fluted tongue, the frog gobbles up insects that live underground like termites and ants. Rarely does it leave the safety of its underground unless it rains during the monsoon season. This is the time for mating, as evidenced by the loud calls male deep out these purple frogs bellow out from under the sand in mountain stream. It had always been assumed that it was a northern flying squirrel gliding through the canopies of Pacific coastal forests, but now a recent in-depth investigation of the animal's DNA is proving otherwise. The fairy creature is actually a distinct species which has now been named Humboldt flying squirrel, and a new study describes how scientists are up upending for a flying squirrel taxonomy. For over 200 years, scientists have thought that only two species of flying squirrel live in the Americas, says Brian Arbogast, a University of North Carolina at Wilmington professor who directed the SUS study. How could a distinct species exist along the Pacific coast and escape the notice of scientists who first observed the northern flying squirrel in 1801? They look similar. But Humboldt flying squirrels are generally smaller and darker. With new genetic information, we know there's no gene clue at all between the two, says Nick Herculas, HSU Biology's instructor and a member of the research team. Researchers at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute and their colleagues compared fossil porcupine fish jaws and tooth plates collected on expeditions to Panama, Colombia, Venezuela and Brazil with those from museum specimens and modern porcupine fish and revealed three new species. Startled porcupine fish suck in air or water to inflate their bodies becoming a prickly balloon-like shape to defend themselves from predators and some contain a neurotoxin a thousand times more potent than cyanide in their ovaries and livers. They're also good at offence, crushing the shells of clams and other marine mollusks with beak-like claws, which are so tough that they're sometimes preserved as fossils to be discovered millions of years later. And that's pretty much it for this month. But before we go, there's this. And in next month's episode... Karina and Julia go hunting werewolves in Cornwall. Or should that be... Karina and Julia go hunting werewolves in Cornwall. And there's this. The CFZ isn't about money. It never has been and it never will be. But money is, I'm afraid, a necessary evil, and we need more of it than we've got at the moment if we're going to carry on with the programme of activities across the world that we so dearly want to do. Therefore, I'm very pleased to announce that my mate Louis from Sussex is going to be taking over a fundraising initiative and running a Patreon campaign, one of the new generation of crowdfunding initiatives which are so useful in raising money for organisations like ours. Keep your eyes peeled. Watch this space. There'll be more information about his activities very soon. Thank you for watching this month's episode. We hope you enjoyed it, and we hope you tune in next time. Goodbye! I'm afraid I'm not very well this week, so I would like to thank Karina, Charlotte and Graham for picking up the slack where I couldn't manage to be on camera. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed it. The feedback that we're getting from the new series of On the Track is remarkable, and I very much hope that we will be going from strength to strength. And I hope next month you'll tune in again. So until then, be seeing you. <laughs>